Housing Notebook on WBAI. My name is Scott Somer, and we're here this evening with Fitzroy Christian, who is a leader of CASA, which is the Community Action for Safe Apartments. And uh, we have Fitzroy on this group up in the Bronx, but they're involved in a citywide struggle. And uh, Fitzroy, why don't you tell us a little about CASA, and then we'll start talking about the uh, issue at hand about mandatory inclusionary zoning. Tell us a little bit about CASA. Okay. Yeah, CASA stands actually for Community Action for Safe Apartments. We are an initiative of new settlement apartments in the southwest Bronx, which owns and operates 17 rent-stabilized apartments, um, all of it in the Mount Eden section of the Bronx. Our mission, um, the CASA itself, is to organize tenants, and we organize with the mission to have tenants stay in their homes, in their communities, especially here in the Bronx where a lot of them stayed through the fires and the disinvestment of the 70s and 80s. They rebuilt the Bronx and they built the institutions that are today the foundation of the new Bronx that the city wants to build on. And our struggle is for the community to stay here and that whatever redevelopment takes place is done with these people in mind and that they become the beneficiaries of this new reinvestment and not be replaced um, by people coming in um, from outside of the community. Okay, so, so tell me a little bit about this. So we have an issue here now. Mayor de Blasio got elected with a pledge to create 200,000 apartments or preserve. You know, we're all in favor and supportive of that. And he put out this plan for mandatory inclusionary zoning, which would require, if you know, we look at it from up high in the sky, require development of affordable housing. But it seems like throughout the city, a lot of groups like CASA and others have been having problems with that. So what specifically are your concerns? The major concern is that none of the plans that the mayor has put forward so far is intended for the people who live in the areas that are being upzoned. Now, we all know that when rezoning takes place, especially when it moves from commercial or industrial zones to residential zones, the value of the land changes dramatically overnight because um, residential use of the land is the most profitable use of the land. That means that landlords, developers see an opportunity to be making massive amount of profits by building in these areas. Now, while it is laudable that the mayor wants to build and preserve 200,000 units, we are saying that most of these units, if not all of them, should be focusing the people who right now live in substandard housing. They should be for people who are doubling up and chipping up in their homes because even though the rent may seem to be affordable to others, it is not affordable to people who make $25,000, $27,000 per year. We are saying that the monetary um, inclusionary housing amendment that the mayor um, presented does not include anybody who makes less than $40,000. He's speaking about um, people making 80% of the area median income, which means people who make $69,000, they're the ones who get in 30% of the housing. The other 70% um, will be at the discretion of the developer, so they could go for luxury housing or if they get um, additional incentives, they may make 10 or 20% of it available to people who make less than 69,000. Um, that excludes a very large portion of the Southwest Bronx whose income in Community Board 4 and Community Board 5 ranges from 21,000 to $25,000 per year for a family of three. So will that any is a major problem. So is any of the housing going to be able to help those people who live there currently? Not the way the mayor is presenting his mandatory inclusion of housing plan. Absolutely none of it is geared towards anybody who makes less than fifty thousand dollars for a family of three. So, so when there's been you know conversation, or has there been conversation with City Hall? Let me ask that first. Has there been conversation between the community and City Hall about this shortfall? Yes, we have been reaching out to 
elected officials and to the mayor's office directly. Um, we are only now beginning to get a little bit of a response from the mayor's office. Um, we have had a lot more response from members, um, the Bronx members of um, city of the city council. Um, they are all supportive of the reinvestment in the Bronx, and they are all supportive of housing for the people who most need it which are the people who are at the very bottom of the economic scale. Some of the things we're asking for, um, four things in particular, I should say. One, we're saying that affordability should mean affordability for the people who live here, not affordability for the people who we intend to bring in. So now when the mayor says we want affordable housing, we're asking the question, affordable for whom? because his mandatory inclusionary housing plan starts at $50,000 and go up from there. Not too many people in the area along Jerome Avenue that has been studied make that type of money. We are also saying that the city needs to put in place very strong anti-displacement, anti-harassment policies, which will make it difficult for landlords and for developers to harass tenants out of their homes here in the Bronx now. Um, it's easy for them to push them out to find all kind of ways to get rid of the tenants who are here now so that they can rebuild the rebuild apartments, well, put on new apartments where they once was business, and attract a higher economic group of people. What are some of the things? What are some of the things? That? What are some of the things you've been seeing? Um, two things we can see: um, different things in the commercial area and the residential area. Um, and the commercial area, which is dominated um, with the automotive um, industry, um, repair shops, glass shops, muffler shops sound shops and um, security shops, that the businesses that were once getting five and ten year leases and now getting one year lease if they get any lease at all. What we find is that those who are paying like $3,500 per month um, for their space is now all of a sudden being asked to pay $55,000, $60,000. We're talking about 500, 600% increase from one month to the next. We're finding where a lot of these um, small stores, the delis, the bodegas, and the other places are saying, we have been closed out. Where are we going to go? We can't afford to pay sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 a month for this space, which is a strategy that the developers are using to force these people out so that they could close the businesses and build houses where once there were um, small neighborhood stores. In the residential area, what we find is that landlords are refusing to do the necessary repairs. They are allowing the buildings to go into disrepair. They are taking tenants to housing court and all kinds of frivolous charges, building a kind of paper trail to say, we don't want these people as tenants because look at this, over the last two years, we've had to take them to court 10 times for not paying their rent. They are chronic late payers or non-rent payers. The truth is that most of those cases are thrown out because when they go to court, all of a sudden they find their receipts. But it looks um, as if the tenant was not paying the rent because here they go 10 times in two years to court for non-payment. So the harassment um, where these people find themselves probably being threatened, their jobs being threatened, because they have to ask for so much time off to go to court to answer these frivolous charges that um, sometimes they give up and they move or they give up and pay monies that they should not be paying simply so that they can keep their jobs because they can't afford to ask for any more time off. These are some of the strategies that the landlords and the developers are using in our area of the Bronx to drive people out of their homes. And what kind of, you know, you say you've been reaching out to the city hall and it seems like that hasn't really moved anywhere yet. Um, I know that the, you know, these uh, proposals have been going through various uh, processes at community boards or whatever. What's happened with that in the Bronx? 
In the Bronx, it was universally um, turned down. All the community boards in the Bronx said no to both the quality um, and the MIA, the mandatory inclusionary housing plans that the mayor proposed. And the Bronx Board President himself followed through afterwards with a no. Now, we have to understand that these are non-binding votes. They are advisory votes. Um, the mayor, if he wants to, could push ahead and try to fight it out in City Hall. But um, the tenor of the people right now, the anger that the people are displaying and the unanimous vote that what the mayor is presenting is not acceptable in any shape or form, should at least give him pause and ask him to come back to the community to find out what is it that they want. Um, here in the South Bronx, CASA has worked with several community organizations, faith-based organizations, labor, other community groups, other legal services groups, and have formed a coalition called Community Vision, um, Community Action for Safe Vision. We have developed a platform in which we have come up with some proposals that we want the city to look at. We had um, over 1,500 people meeting several times over the last seven to eight months. Um, we have had a, quite a few um, focus um, groups. We have developed this plan, which we released on October 21st, where we set out what the people are saying here in the South Bronx what they want to see, where they want to see it, how they want to see the area developed. And it is all based on the philosophy that there can be development, there can be growth without massive displacement. That we do not believe that gentrification is the answer. Gentrification is <clears throat> social engineering, and it is not natural, and it is quite possible for the area to be developed uh, with very little displacement, and those who come in we're coming to join the people who are here and not coming as a placement for the people who have been displaced. Mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in, we're chatting with Fitzroy Christian from uh, CASA, which is uh, the coalition for, I'm blanking in a moment here. But <laughs> Community <laughs> Action for Safe, safe apartments. apartments. Community Action for Safe Apartments, sorry about that. From the Bronx, and we're talking about the mayor's plan for inclusionary zoning mandatory inclusionary is the only concept people are supportive of, however, the devil is in the details, and here the devil is that it really wouldn't be uh, apartments that are developed for the actual people who live in the community, uh, in the Bronx in this case, but it's been facing problems throughout the city in that the uh, the plans from reports really are just not, they're not, it seems like it's not tailored towards the communities that they are trying to do this in, but in fact they're just trying to do a one-size-fits-all, and that really doesn't work in New York. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, if you could let me interrupt you here for a no, second. No, please go. Please go. Is that it is, not, it is not only in the Bronx where the mayor's um, amendment, tax amendment plans have been turned down. So far, um, the last I heard, there were only two um, community boards in the entire city so far, out of about 18 or 19 that have voted yes. And um, I'm not so sure that they may not um, call their votes back, as happened in the Bronx, where these two community um, boards, they had initially not voted no. They had a meeting, came back together, we studied the proposals, looked at the language again, and changed the votes to a no, so that the entire bank was um, unanimous. Um, I think that it's quite possible in other areas when people begin to understand exactly what the proposals entail and that nothing is happening for the people who currently live in the areas being rezoned. Absolutely nothing. Everything is geared towards bringing people in um, who are not there now and bringing in the infrastructure for them, rebuilding the infrastructure, building in services, bringing in amenities for the people who are coming in and not for the people who are there. Mm -hmm. And also, I obviously read through the document you referred to earlier, the Bronx Coalition for Community Vision. It was released October 21st. Mm -hmm. It's very you know, thorough. 
I mean, you're also looking for not just, you know, affordable housing and for, you know, the preservation of the, the small businesses in the community, but also looking for, you know, a voice and for jobs for people as well. Yes, what we are saying is that in our community here, we have the highest unemployment um, levels in New York City. A lot of the people who work here work in construction. Um, the Labor Congress said there's something like 30-something thousand in the different trades who live in our area of the Bronx. What we say is that these are the people who should be getting the jobs to build the homes in their communities. And they're the ones who should be working as apprentices in union jobs so they can be trained properly by union workers, people who have the skills, people who have already been certified. So that instead of it being a job, they're in a path to get a career. In doing so, what we're doing is not just creating unsafe work environments where people are doing, making shortcuts because they're using non-union labor. But the people who are employed are going to be young men and young women who will have a career and not just a job. That will allow them to work for living wages and which will allow them to begin to pull their families out of the circle and the cycle of poverty in the Bronx. If we don't do this, what we're doing is just giving them a job where they're going to be sweeping the streets or where they're going to be directing traffic and they're going to be just as poor at the end of all of this construction as they were when it began. Nothing is going to happen, and then they cannot, uh, would not be able to afford to live in the house, in the apartments that they have to build. We're saying that is wrong. Um, labor has decided that they have a way where they can make it um, less expensive for the building because of arrangements they can make for the way apprentices can be paid so that it is not going to be any more expensive using labor as it was for using non-union work. And in this way, everybody wins. Um, you get um, good jobs for the people who are working there. they are union jobs with all the safeguard and the experience of union workers. Uh, we don't have all these accidents in the work sites because people are untrained and people are taking shortcuts to make quick bucks. So everything wins. The city wins. The people who live in the area wins. Um, they get to live in their homes. They get to have careers, and they get to start uh, to change the, um, the poverty um, that's here in the Bronx. And that is what we are asking for. So, so in, the, in the minute or two we have left, um, you know, for this segment, uh -huh. obviously we have, um, you know, you've laid it out quite clearly and, and really well. I really. Well, I commend you. It's like me. It's because it's a very dense, complicated issue, and you've really just boiled it down to areas that people can really grasp. And I appreciate that, and I thank you for it. So, obviously, to get the yeah, we want the, we, the real affordable housing for people who really live in the community who are not being brought into the community, and also we don't want to displace the current tenants. We don't want to harass out the the businesses. You know, we need our uh, shoemakers and like you know mom and pop stores, and we want the, the good jobs for everyone. Yeah. Now, this ultimately ends up at the city council as the last place after all the advisories and the commissions and whatever and the planning commission, whatever. It mm -hmm. will land at city council. So what is it that you want from people to get involved? How do you want them to get involved so we can have true inclusionary affordable housing? Um, it's for everybody in New York City to look at what happened in the areas of Brooklyn, Harlem, and Queens. Where under the previous administrations, communities were not allowed to be involved. And there were so many hundreds of people who are now living in the Bronx who were pushed out of um, Park Slope, um, out of Bushwick, um, from the Lower East Side, from Harlem, because the plans were and the message was we are redeveloping. We are bringing new amenities. We are bringing more investment into the, your communities, and everybody's going to benefit. What they did not say and what was allowed to happen was that they brought it in not for the people who were living there, but for a different group of people. The big box stores came in and killed the small mom and pop stores. Um, the places where we normally get our supplies, whether for our homes or more kitchens or whatever, they were no longer there. 
the type of clothing, the type of things where we would buy, they, they were no longer there. And those of us who tried to remain found it so expensive we had to move because we could not afford to live in that community anymore. In Harlem, in Bushwick, in the Lower East Side, everybody was, um, was being driven out. And what is happening now is that the Bronx is the last affordable um, borough in New York City. It is now targeted for redevelopment. And we are saying we don't want it to be the same as what happened before. We want the redevelopment, but there can be development without displacement. Um, and we want the mandatory inclusionary housing to be truly inclusionary and include people who are coming in to join those who are here. We don't want it to be exclusionary where the people here go to be pushed out, um, only to be replaced by new people who um, of a different um, ethnic group, with a different economic group, with a different um, set of characters. The Bronx was rebuilt by a unique set of people um, over the last 40 years. When the city was disinvesting, they stayed. Um, the Bronx has a peculiar um, culture that you cannot see anywhere else in New York City. I mean, in three blocks, in three city blocks here in the Bronx, you could hear three different types of music. You hear maybe seven or eight different languages. Um, there's so much difference here, five or six aroma, salt in your noses um, from the different cuisines, from the different nationalities. It's a very unique place. Um, that essential character should not be changed. Okay. If uh, the gentrification goes forward, that will be lost in the city mm -hmm. forever. Well, Fitzroy Charles from – Fitzroy Christian, I'm sorry, from uh, CASA, I want to yeah. thank you for – taking your time to view this this evening. If people want more information on what's happening in the Bronx, they can go to bronxcommunityvision.org. That's www.bronxcommunityvision.org. And also you can learn about, you know, just Google mandatory inclusionary housing and you'll uh, New York City, NYC, and you'll see all the stuff happening all over the city as well. Um, yeah. Keep us up to date, and we hope to have you back soon. Thank you, and thank you for having us. And um Good night and happy holidays to all of New York City. Thank you. And that was Fitzroy Christian from CASA talking about the struggle against the mayor's mandatory inclusionary housing plan because the intent is good, but the details aren't. You're tuned to a list of sponsor WBAI in New York. It's 841 in the evening. And uh, just give me a minute or two, and we're going to go get our next guest. And while we're doing that, you can listen to this. <laughs> 